Hello and thank you for joining me. We live in a changing climate. Can we create a better future by finding the positive and solutions in the tales we tell and in the challenges of writing dystopian and utopian literature? My name is Deborah Tompkins and I run a network of writers called Bristol Climate Writers. Today I want to explore what speculative utopian and dystopian fiction has to tell us about our possible futures. I'm indebted to fellow climate writers Pete Sutton and Emma Turnbull for their insights. I will briefly define utopia and dystopia then explore each in more depth and show you some examples of each and examine their place in writing about climate change. Then I will come to my conclusion. All fiction is speculative in a way as it deals with imaginary people and events. But as a technical term, speculative means set somewhere in the future or in an alternative reality. It often explores issues that society wrestles with on a daily basis. We all know examples, George Orwell's 1984, the movie The Day After Tomorrow, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, Star Trek. It can overlap with science fiction, but it doesn't have to. We are in a climate and ecological emergency. What we do now will determine in part how the future will be. With carbon emissions rising and with a time lag between emissions and their effects of 30 to 40 years, so we're seeing today the effects of carbon emissions from the 1980s, and with unprecedented levels of wildlife loss, globally we've lost about 60% of all wild animals since 1970, and also since 1970 our global human population has more than doubled, some may ask, what is the point of telling stories when we simply have to act and act fast? We're creatures of story, unique in the animal kingdom. Story is how we make sense of the world and how we learn. I have memories at school of desperately trying to learn history dates for exams, getting muddled with all the names of kings and dates of battles. My husband, who possibly had a far better history teacher than me, remembers these things with ease. He links dates with personalities and events, can see and understand the overarching stories, how they link, and what has led up to what we have today. Story is how we learn best. It's the way our brains are made. We're aware of climate change and ecological damage, yet we struggle to make sense of it. We struggle to make sense of what it means for us or for the future. We want to know what it's going to be like. And this is why I started writing climate fiction, to make sense of it to see in my mind's eye the most likely future. Everyone has a model of the world built from stories. Our personal reality, as well as a majority story in which a, which a particular society or part of society perceives as a kind of truth. This can change. A hunter-gatherer society has a very different consensual reality than our dominant Western view. Our Western myth of progress and modernity sees the green narrative of buying and consuming less and less as rather primitive. Nathaniel Rich, the author of Odds Against Tomorrow, written just before Hurricane Sandy devastated New York, about a hurricane devastating New York, said this, I think we need a new type of novel to address a new type of reality, which is that we're headed towards something terrifying and large and transformative. And it's the novelist's job to try to understand what is that doing to us. Most speculative fiction about a climate altered world is dystopian. A dystopia is a hostile world where everything is the worst it can be. There's conflict, war, environmental degradation, runaway climate change, 
social inequality, violence and so on. In contrast, a utopia is an ideal or perfect state or place, a perfect world with no conflict or problems. Everyone lives in harmony with each other and with the natural world. Both types of fiction have their roots in reality, live today. There are more dystopian novels than utopian ones. So why read or write dystopia? When we want a better world, why consider a worse one? The cultural theorist Paul Virilio said, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. And when you invent electricity, you invent electrocution. Every technology carries its own negativity, which is invented at the same time as technical progress. Within every dystopia, is a utopia. Within every utopia is a dystopia. Some may see modern Britain as a dystopia born from utopian ideals, light, warmth, food for all, the welfare state, universal suffrage, but at what price? Consumerist capitalism and environmental degradation? And one person's dystopia may be another's utopia. The rise of the far right in recent years may be some person's dystopia, but for another person, it would be idyllic. So here are some reasons to write, read or watch dystopian stories. Escapism. We become absorbed and forget about our everyday worries and looming threats. Perspective. The suffering of fictitious characters makes our own troubles seem less severe. Excitement without danger. Education and personal growth. Valuable lessons about ethical conflicts and moral and physical dangers and threats. We share the characters' adventures without making their mistakes or taking their risks. We watch them grow as their strength resolution, ethics and courage are put to the test. We ask ourselves what we would do in their place. And control. By reading we gain control over our fears, at least temporarily. We can close the book when we've had enough. The best dystopias may be a warning or a call to action, exploring what may logically follow from the point we are at right now. They are not predictions, but speculations, and history will tell. George Orwell's motivation for writing 1984 seems to have been one of warning. Silent Spring by Rachel Carson was a non-fiction, dystopian speculation that was massively influential and in many ways prophetic. But we need to keep recreating these stories as time moves on and society and circumstances change. A more modern example is the powerful near-future thriller, The Water Knife, by American author Paolo Bacigalupi, which explores what happens when drought, brought on by climate change, has devastated the southwestern United States and water is a precious commodity to be fought over, traded and killed for. It's not for the faint-hearted, but it's all too plausible. A recent novel by John Lanchester, more literary and quiet in style, is The War, again near future, when sea level rise has caused the UK to build a giant wall along the whole coast to keep out both the sea and the others, people who've lost their homes and countries due to climate change. I've already mentioned Odds Against Tomorrow by Nathaniel Rich about a man who predicts that a hurricane is likely to devastate New York, but nobody believes him. 
played by James Bradley follows an extended family over several decades during colossal changes occurring to the planet and society from the results of global warming. The End We Start From is a poetic first novel from Megan Hunter about a woman who gives birth to her first child as the waters close over London. Far North by Marcel Theroux is set in a frozen future world, bleak but ultimately hopeful. You remember, of course, that dystopia may contain elements of utopia and vice versa. A Friend of the Earth by T.C. Boyle is old but good and also funny with a bleak and black humour. Speculative when it was published in 2000, set in 2025 when California is experiencing cataclysmic floods due to global warming. The Devil's Highway by Gregory Normanton explores people's lives on the same piece of land during the Roman occupation and now and also far in the future. And there are many more. The Hunger Games trilogy by Suzanne Collins. The Oryx and Crake trilogy by Margaret Atwood. The Carbon Diaries by Stacey Lloyd. You can find lists of climate change novels or cli-fi on the internet and most, as I say, are dystopian. They vary in quality as with all genre of writing. Utopian literature takes many forms and the journey towards utopia can be seen as important as the destination. Ideas can be explored without being lived, testing the robustness of the system. The author dreams impossible dreams, exploring not only humans' relationship with the natural world, but the social and economic systems of a different kind of society. So let's look at the original Utopia written by Thomas More over 500 years ago. There is no private property on Utopia. Goods are stored in warehouses and people request what they need. Houses are never locked and are rotated between citizens every 10 years. Agriculture is the most important occupation. Every person engages in farming for two years at a time with women doing the same work as men. They must all learn at least one other essential trade, weaving, carpentry, metalsmithing and masonry. Everyone must work, unemployment is eradicated. But there are slaves. Everyone wears the same simple clothes and there is no fine apparel. There's a welfare state with free hospitals, euthanasia permitted by the state, priests are allowed to marry, divorce is permitted, premarital sex is punished by a lifetime of enforced celibacy and adultery is punished by enslavement. Meals are taken in community dining halls. Travel on the island is only permitted with an internal passport. Non-compliance is punishable with slavery. But there are no lawyers and the law is deliberately simple for everyone to understand. There are several religions and each is tolerant of the others. Only atheists are despised. Wives and husbands are subject to each other although women confess their sins to their husbands once a month. Gambling, hunting, makeup and astrology are all discouraged. Privacy is not regarded as freedom. Taverns, alehouses and places for private gatherings are non-existent in order to keep all men in full view so they are obliged to behave themselves. For more, look it up on Wikipedia or read the original. You can see how one person's utopia could be another's dystopia. But this was a serious attempt at trying to imagine a different kind of society. Perhaps not the kind of society we would want. I feel very sorry for the slaves. And this included 
economic, political and social systems. So dystopias can outline the trouble that awaits us when things go wrong and they can go perhaps a little too far. The bleak but beautiful film Blade Runner depicted a future without trees, impossible for human or planetary survival. Cormac McCarthy's post-apocalyptic novel The Road is an emotionally difficult read, relieved only by the humanity and love between father and son. Stories are powerful, and the more we tell nightmare stories of, of the future, the more these become integrated into our collective and individual stories. When we get scared and overwhelmed, we can shut down, go into denial, and seek comfort in self-destructive behaviours like alcohol or drugs, or other forms of escapism, such as foreign holidays, shopping for luxuries, living only for today and not thinking about the future. We can also experience severe anxiety, depression, insomnia, irritability and so on, unable to find a way out of the emotional chaos caused by fear of the future and the apparent lack of meaningful action in the world around us. So, in the face of climate change and ecological catastrophe, are utopias pointless thought experiments, fantasy worlds we can never reach, or do they serve a more functional political purpose, blueprints for a better future? Dr Denise Baden, Professor of Sustainable Business at Southampton University, argues that catastrophic environmental scenarios and the rhetoric of going without put off political parties from embracing green policies because of the fear of putting off voters. Her research shows that solution-based stories or stories that smuggle in green ideas or characters in an otherwise mainstream story are more likely to inspire green behaviours than catastrophic tales of climate change. To that end, she's created a series of creative writing competitions, now in their third year, aiming to engage the public in creating positive visions of a sustainable society called Green Stories, uh, for which I've been a judge. If you are interested, do check them out, greenstories.org.uk. The competitions cover a wide range of writing, uh, with short stories, children's books, novels, TV series, stage plays, video games and many more. So a different kind of storytelling can allow space for hope and to believe in a different kind of outcome. When the subconscious has a positive view of the future, it sets about automatically making this happen. Utopias offer a way out of fear and paralysis and can help us build emotional resources that make it safe to confront difficult realities and create positive new ones. Utopias offer a useful framework for new thinking, even if they're never achieved. So how do we live in a way that doesn't require 3.6 planets, that honours planetary limits, protects wildlife, forests and oceans, allows for justice and compassion towards the world's poorest and equality for all. The prize-winning utopian science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson believes that we have a choice about how the future plays out. We can use narrative, story, to imagine a different future rather than just using words or labels such as climate emergency, decarbonisation, permaculture, sixth mass extinction, mitigation, unprecedented, sustainable development, and so on, words that have the smack of jargon about them or are at least used as shorthand. Using imagination to find a different path, to avoid the worst that's predicted, will create a more sustainable way of life in its deepest sense. It's not just about electric cars or paper bags versus plastic or low energy light bulbs. Although important, 
These are only details in the scheme of things. Kim Stanley Robinson is a sophisticated writer, attuned to our difficulties as well as our possibilities. He understands that people can get things wrong, both personally and politically. His novels address politics, sociology and economics, as well as green issues and his characters' personal lives, and his scientific research is meticulous. His detailed books are both utopian and dystopian. Each utopia he is attempting to create in his thought experiments does indeed contain the seeds of its own downfall and is not afraid of looking at all sides, light and dark, of a potential society. He's famous for his Mars trilogy, Red Mars, Blue Mars and Green Mars, where humans terraform Mars and create a new society. And his Science in the Capital trilogy, set in Washington DC at a time of rapid climate change. You can look up 40 Signs of Rain and you'll see the whole series there. His newest novel, the title of it, is New York 2140, which tells you everything you need to know about it, really. The most reliable test of utopian works is the capacity to generate new ideas. Well-constructed utopian novels are a conversation rather than a polemic, with the potential to generate new thinking and to be transformative. A huge influence on Kim Stanley Robinson is Ursula Le Guin, who also imagined utopian societies, again with a close eye on human frailty. The Dispossessed is considered to be her greatest work. Its subtitle is An Ambiguous Utopia, and it was published in 1974. I don't have a copy here to show you, but I do have The Word for World is Forest, set on a beautiful forested planet populated by a different species of human beings. It's utopian until we arrive from Earth. And the word for world is Earth on our planet. And we introduce the concepts of taking by force and murder. Short and powerful, it is really worth reading. Have a Gay by the Scottish poet and author John Burnside is a more recent book and it follows a man fleeing ecological and social collapse and arriving on a remote Scottish island. It's beautifully written and just a little bit polemical. I think we need more utopian writing, not because it will provide the answers, but because it will help us to get beyond the disaster movie type thinking and into those necessary conversations about the kind of society we want to aim for the kind of world we want to live in, and the possible solutions, the roadmap, if you like, about how to get there. So, in conclusion, all good fiction has a story arc, deep characterization, solid motivations, richness and colour, and a satisfying conclusion which is logically consistent with a believable world created by the author. Not all books stand the test of time, but I think most of these will. As humans, we seem to need both types of literature, dystopian and utopian, both kinds of story to make sense of the world. And climate literature shows us both kinds, the warnings, and the roadmaps and possibilities. So have a look at the books on your shelves, perhaps with a new eye, and consider what kind of society they may be reflecting or imagining. And if you enjoy writing, why not have a go at writing some climate fiction yourself, a story set in dystopia, or one set in a utopia? You may find the utopian story more difficult, which is all the more reason to give it a go. And perhaps too, 
consider writing for the Green Stories competitions which are free to enter. And do read some of the books I've mentioned if you don't already know them. Thank you for being part of my audience today. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's, I hope it's given you lots to think about and potentially books to read and consider. Goodbye.